Thank you all of you for joining us today. My name is Jonathan Romero, and I am one of the quantum computing scientists and co-founders of Zapata Computing. At Zapata, we develop quantum software solutions to address the computational challenges of businesses and researchers. And for the past two years, we have had the fortune of working with BP on a project to explore the potential of quantum computing in chemistry simulation. And today with me, I have two of the architects of this project, Plena Abuan and Cornelio Buda. Plen and Cornelio, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Klena Abon and I am part of BP's uh, digital science and engineering organization. Um, our remit is to look at emerging digital technologies that might be five to 10 years out and understand how they might be transformational for our organization. Um, and so I really see uh, my role as being a tour guide into potential futures and uh, technologies such as uh, quantum computing are, are very important to us. Um, uh, which is why we're really excited to be here today to talk to you about some of the work we've been doing. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Cornelio Buda. I am a computational chemist within BP. Uh, I am a beginner in quantum computing. And uh, although I read something about the com uh, quantum computing before, I have learned much more since uh, I started this uh, collaboration on, the, on this project with Zapata. And uh, recently, I even uh, have my hands-on experience with uh, quantum computing. Uh, I have been using Zapata uh, quantum workflow platform named Orchestra to, to submit some of the calculation in uh, several quantum devices available. Yeah, and today we're going to discuss some of the results of that um, project that Cornelio just mentioned. But maybe before we jump into the details of the project, I wanted to start discussing a little bit of the motivation behind it. And one thing that I've always wondered, Klena, uh, from your position as a leader in digital innovation, uh, why did you think it was the right move to start exploring quantum solutions for chemistry? Well, Jonathan, um, as with all emerging technologies that we look at, um, the first question that we ask ourselves is, could this be transformational for what we do um, within our organization? Um, and if it is, uh, then the next question that we would ask ourselves is, is this something that we need to wait on in order to understand um, once the technology is fully developed or, or is this something that we need to mm -hmm. understand now? And because uh, quantum computing requires uh, some, some thinking about how you can leverage um, the power that you could potentially gain from it, um, and we also understand that while it won't necessarily um, it won't necessarily completely replace classical computing, it will definitely help us um, with some of the problems that we consider intractable today. Because of that, we decided it was really important to start exploring um, how can we leverage this technology, what are our priority areas, um, and chemistry was definitely one of those areas for us. Yeah, and certainly chemistry is one of those areas that can benefit from quantum computing. Uh, and Cornelio, you're a quantum chemistry, uh, a quantum chemist, and um, you know you work in your day to day applying quantum chemistry to solve problems for BP. So um, I wanted I wanted to know what seemed promising or what was exciting about using quantum computing to solve some of the chemistry problems you work on. Well, uh, we selected uh, the. Uh, to, to apply quantum computing to uh, uh, predicting thermodynamic data uh, for the reactions. And uh, it is well known how important it, this is for uh, to support the experimental side. So especially when uh, com uh, competing reaction are, are, are possible here. So using the computational methods, the, the reaction energetics uh, can be predicting, predicted faster and cheaper guiding the uh, experiments. Also, when uh, expensive or toxic components can be tested, uh, should be tested without, uh, I mean, when we have this uh, expensive or, or toxic components, you can use computational mm -hmm. method to, to replace those with cheaper and safer options. Mm. I mean, classical computer methods here are, uh, using several approximation at this, at this moment. And therefore, the energetics values are less accurate. And uh, from discussion mm. with, with, uh, with, with Zapata, I uh, 
you know, there were some promising alternatives to use quantum computing to increase the correlation effect, reaching toward the complete basis set. So that's what we we were uh, we were uh, we we select to use quantum computing for for this this specific task. I see, and uh, and the algorithm that we selected to actually study those specific uh, in, uh, reaction energies uh, was the variational quantum eigensolver, which is a near-term quantum oh. algorithm. Um, and we, we chose the variational quantum eigensolver because we want to drive that value, uh, you know, in the near term, right? Uh, but um, there was also a process behind, you know, choosing this particular use case. Um, and Cornelio, you, you led that process, that selection process. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, as someone that um, is starting from quantum chemistry is working uh, his way into quantum computing, and that have gone through the experience of selecting use cases, could you provide some guidance to some of the scientists and project leads in the audience about how to select use cases or what should be, how should you frame the question uh, when selecting a use case? Well, there are several challenges on computational size, but aside, but we selected uh, uh, for for testing the uh, for future testing that uh, predicting the thermodynamic data for for uh, specific reactions, uh, especially for small molecule from for now, and uh, the reason behind the selection is well as as um, um, uh, people know is well known that is uh, uh, just a small number of qubits available at this point. Uh, gate mm -hmm. error, you know, the time requested to get the chemical accuracy. So that's what we selected, just the small molecules for now to use for the thermodynamic data prediction. Well, uh, for, uh, and again, this is a proof of concept project and uh, I'm uh, mm -hmm. uh, optimistic that, you know, in the future, the energetic uh, for the uh, for the reaction uh, will be able to be uh, w we can predict that for a bigger molecule and uh, near future as as Kalena pointed out earlier five ten years probably we should be able to do that yeah yeah that that is the aspiration but um but yeah certainly with this proof of concept we we start you know already looking at uh, a problem that um sort of approximates or is close to what you actually want to get um, in industry. And to contextualize the audience a little bit about the project, right? Uh, we framed the project as a simple question, um, which, which was what quantum computational resources do we need to achieve quantum advantage in, the, in this specific task, the task of computing these, these uh, thermodynamic properties? Um, and that means essentially figuring out how many qubits, how many measurements, and how much fidelity we need to achieve a target accuracy. And, that, and then translate that into runtime uh, and a resource assessment that we can compare with the state-of-the-art classical algorithm, which in this case uh, for the project was COPEC cluster. Um, so that way is how we, we can establish an idea on how and when we will achieve this quantum advantage. Um, and as simple as it can sound, um, assessing the performance and resources of this algorithm in a rigorous data-driven way um, is a lot of work. And it took us months, right? Um, and along the way, we had to make some assumptions as well uh, because the machines are not too big, as you mentioned, Cornelio. Uh, so we had to run classical simulations, carry out extrapolations. But at the end, I think we were able to make a prediction on the amount of resources and the performance of BQE. Um, and the result was very revealing, I think, to all of us. Um, we found essentially that because of the amount of measurements uh, needed for BQE, the run times are not practical, even for this POC. And it would take several days, in fact, to compute a single energy evaluation for the size of the instances that we need and the desired accuracy. And you know, for many people in the audience that is familiar with BQE, they might already be aware that BQE requires a lot of measurements if you want to get uh, enough precision. But I think very few people have gone through the process of doing the actual estimate for a problem of the size and the level of accuracy required for BQE um, to be useful to someone like Cornelio, who is a scientist at a company that needs to deliver accurate results uh, for production purposes. 
So, um, so that was that result was very surprising to me, and of course we had to communicate that result uh, to you uh, during the development of the project. And I, I've I've been always curious to know uh, how did you feel about that result? Like, essentially, how how did this result impact your expectations uh, for quantum computing uh, and for the project? Uh, and you know, for I would like to ask that to both of you, uh, Cornelio. Maybe you can uh, start. Sure. Uh, well, for me, this is a real test for existing quantum resources. You know, probably I was a little bit uh, optimistic at the beginning, I would like to say. But uh, that is what is happening when you work on the uh, groundbreaking projects, I guess. So um, I like to believe that and, uh, we are among the first who evaluate a VQ for the real system, I would say. Now, there is a lot of learning uh, from our side, and I would like to believe Zapata uh, feels the same way. And uh, we, we will, I hope that we will be able to publish the results soon to share, share this with, with the outside. Um, again, being optimistic is, is okay, I will say. And uh, uh, we may need to wait, I'm still optimistic, by the way, we, we may need to wait another, well, five, 10 years probably for quantum computing hardware to develop. Uh, to a level uh, required to tackle this problem, to be able to, to uh, really use for, for the reactions of interest. At this point, again, this is a proof of concept and we, we prove it, we, I hope we prove it for everybody that is working. Yeah, and you mentioned, as you mentioned, it's a proof of concept, but that's the way we're gonna build towards, you know, achieving that, that advantage in, in the near right. term. And I guess, Glenn, and your, the same question for, for you, uh, how this result impact your expectations for, for quantum computing and the project? Yeah, I, I think the results um, that we've seen so far, Jonathan, are, are really important to us in terms of informing our overall strategy. And um, uh, some of you who may have heard our colleague, Richard Debney, um, speak earlier about BP's approach readiness. This is exactly the reason why um, we need to do proofs of concepts, or I think he referred to it as proof of, proof of values, um, is, is to really understand um, for the types of things that we are wanting to apply uh, quantum computing to, um, what are the resources that are going to be needed, um, and, and also uncover these types of things um, early on so that we can start to uh, work together um, with those that are leading in the industry to figure out how to um, you know, are there techniques that we can do to, to mitigate some of these issues or work around them? So it was really important um, for, for us uh, to be able to do this work early on um, to start to gain that understanding um, and prepare. Yeah, certainly. And uh, as Cornelio mentioned as well, there is a lot that we also learn, you know, on the, as, as developers of quantum algorithms uh, on the software side from this project. And, and I think the insight that we get from working in a project directly uh, with industry where the goal is actually to solve a practical problem is very different from what we get just you know, running a small examples. And I think in this case, uh, we try many smart methods that have been developed to reduce the number of measurements in VQE, including many of the state-of-the-art grouping techniques. And essentially what we discovered is that they, we found that they help, but they are not enough. Uh, to, to get you when you want to be. And now because of the project, we are looking at techniques that incorporate more quantum coherence in the measurement process, um, like the enhanced likelihood function technique that Zapata has developed, right? And I think that that insight is very valuable for the field of quantum computing. And in, in similarly, one thing that I wanted to ask you, Elena, is you know also from the perspective of your organization, of BP, um, how, how does this project is also creating that value and helping you advance your goals? Well, I think, um, so as, as uh, we had mentioned earlier, Richard had mentioned earlier, you know, there are really four pillars um, to our approach, which is around partnerships, um, platforms, which is talking about, you know, the various hardware um, and also uh, our people uh, capability. Um, and so, and, and of course, the proof of value. Um, and so this work that we've been doing has really touched on all four of those pillars. Um, one, in terms of proof of value, we already started to discuss that. Um, we, uh, 
uh, not only do we now have a better understanding of you know, how this could apply in the space of chemistry, but we have an understanding of the potential resources that are required. Um, we're, uh, we, we've been able to work with uh, you on um, new techniques, which has been really exciting. Um, but at the same time, we're also starting to build capability, right? Uh, Cornelio has, ha has um, had the opportunity to have, uh, you know, in-depth discussions and, and some of our other subject matter experts that are working with us in these areas um, have been able to have discussions to build their understanding, um, and that will transfer on to other areas um, of, of, as we start to think about how does this apply to some of those other um, problems that we were talking about earlier, which Cornelia brought to the table. Um, you know, so uh, having these partnerships um, is really important to us because it allows us to start understanding um, and start to uh, kind of formulate our approach and, and fine tune it even better. Um, so uh, we've been really excited about the work that we are doing here because it translates in so many different ways. Yeah, and, and I think, um, you know, it has certainly an impact um, for your industry and your goals, but I, I, I really want to highlight the impact that it has also for the field of quantum computing, you know, as a scientific field. I think that um, these collaborations with industry can guide us towards practical quantum advantage. Maybe it faster than we would do otherwise. Um, and I think that in the current stage of quantum computing, these collaborations are certainly crucial. Uh, and definitely those industries that embark first will be those that benefit the most from, from the potential of quantum computing. Um, yeah, so I think that with that last remark, we are, we're about to hit our time mark, but um, uh, I think I wish we could have had maybe a longer conversation uh, but I think this has been already very insightful. Um, so thank you, Clena and Cornelio, for taking this time to chat. Uh, it was a pleasure. Yes, we really um, enjoyed so, being part of this panel. Thank you. Yes, and thank you to our audience. Uh, we invite you to take a look uh, at the paper that um, describes part of the results of this project, as, as Cornelio mentioned. Um, and please reach out if you have any questions. Have a great day and enjoy Q2B.